morning session. Uh, and since we are already running a few minutes late, uh, let us get started. Uh, today we have the first talk uh, from Pro Professor uh, Emmanuel Ramitages, and he will discuss. Uh, he is a professor of genetics in Geneva Medical School, and he will discuss uh, his work on. Oh, this should change. It's about phenotypic evolution. Uh, actually, the the effect of uh, genetic variation on phenotype in the hereditary regions. So, Dr. Manolis is coming. So what you get, for example, is how many certain metabolites correlated with blood lipids and so on. 
Now again, this has a correlation structure. It doesn't give you information about causality, but there's one fundamental piece of information that can actually give you, at least in a statistical way, a direction of that effect, and that is DNA variation. Now, for the most part, actually I would say almost in all cases, except potentially for cancer, it's very clear, it's actually fundamental, it's, it's, very, it's sort of an axiom in, in, in biology that whenever you have a, vari a variant that is correlated with a particular phenotype, it has to be that that variant is impacting the phenotype and not vice versa. Because otherwise you would have to assume that the phenotype changing would actually change the nucleotide sequence in the constitutive genome of an individual, which actually is, is extremely unlikely to be possible. So what, what, once you have DNA variation included into these models, essentially you can start putting the first arrows. So you have DNA variation impacting its metabolite, you have DNA variation impacting the expression. And by doing so, you can then statistically infer potential directional effects or independent effects in the rest of the network. So by integrating DNA variation in a network of phenotypes among a number of individuals, you can imagine these phenotypes can be in the orders of thousands if you integrate quantities of uh, levels of expression of individual genes, levels of proteins, levels of metabolites, many measurements that you can make over an individual, you can actually start putting arrows and, put in, and deriving statistically causal networks which you can then validate by using either uh, perspective data or using uh, uh, specific experimental assays in specific cells for targeted uh, interactions. Now at the end of the day, um, what we're interested in doing, and we, it's a very, it's a kind of a, a big we, it's not just my lab, but a very large number of labs, actually many labs are uh, very specific, uh, specifically focused on certain areas, is to attract two different areas. One is to generally understand what we call under, the underlying biology of the disease. And the problem with the, the general thing is that underlying the biology of the disease is, understanding the biology of the disease is, is actually very, um, it's one of the easier goals, I would say, in terms of uh, getting uh, uh, to using the genetic information, because in that case you don't have to specifically account, uh, account for all the variants, you just simply have to see what kind of genes are involved, what kind of pathways are involved in the disease. That's a relatively easy goal, because that's something that we're already doing with uh, GWAS studies. The other thing that is much more difficult is actually getting an individualized risk profile, which from the genetic data alone, it, is, it, is, it appears that for most diseases it's, it's not going to be possible, even if I've accounted for the full set of genetic variants, because they don't explain 100% of the, of the variants of a disease. But what you could do is by integrating omics much later in life, let's say a 40 year old individual, will actually have a transcriptome profile that is a joint effect of their genome as well as their environmental exposures up to that point. And by integrating that, you can actually derive a risk profile that is much more informative than just simply looking at the genotype. And maybe if you do this in a longitudinal way, one can derive models about how the, the transcriptome profile, for example, in blood or skin or whatever tissue and disease you're looking at, is actually going to be predictive of their, of their uh, outcome. Uh, because you're looking at much later in life than just birth. Now my lab has been working on a very, very uh, specific phenotype, which is gene expression. And one of the nice things about gene expression is actually it's present in all cells, and it covers all genes. So we can actually get a much, str a much stronger profile about the state of the cell uh, at that particular stage. By no means uh, this is the, the most comprehensive phenotype, and I don't think there is any such phenotype. You know, we can discuss about whether metabolomics or proteomics or transcriptomics is going to give us a picture. My opinion is that everything is required in order to get a complete picture and everything talks to, to the other uh, sort of level or layer of information. And one of the things that we've been doing quite a lot is trying to discover what we call expression QTLs. So essentially trying to find genetic variants that impact the expression of nearby genes when we're looking at CCQTLs or transcqtls when there's a variant somewhere in early the genome that through some other interactions is impacting the expression of that gene. And what you get is this correlation of genotype to phenotype, where you, for example, in this case, a GG genotype is associated with lower levels of expression than the AA one. And that we call an expression QTL, an expression quantitative trade lock. Now I'm going to talk about two areas that we're going to use that kind of approach of doing genetics of gene expression in order to, to, to address two different questions. One is to actually understand generally how um, 
genetic variation, especially from a, a highly uh, interrogated uh, set of individuals, it's a thousand genome individuals, is impacting gene expression and try to get to causal variants and methodologies that one can discover causal variants. And the second thing is I'm going to try to, to address, to show you some of our recent results in trying to get to regulatory effects in, in, in cancer, in colorectal cancer in particular, and try to get to known coding drivers, which has been one of the very difficult areas uh, given the, the, the known coding space and how much, how little actually we know about uh, interpreting single variations and somatic mutations. Now the first talk is, is, uh, is actually published, there are two papers that are associated with that. One was published in Nature uh, back in uh, September, uh, which is more of, sort of the biological insight uh, story. And then there's another important part of the study which, although it, uh, it's, not, it's more technical and probably much, more, much less biological in terms of insight, it's actually quite important because it describes how we managed to do RNA sequencing in a distributed way in seven different labs. Um, in, um, in, in Europe, and that is actually showing that RNA sequencing technologies, their next sequencing technologies, are actually mature enough uh, to, to be distributed and actually borrow throughput from, uh, from different uh, labs. Now the experiment is this, we, the, project is, the project that this was under was a Giovannis consortium, this was led by Xavi Esteville uh, in Barcelona, and uh, this is a European uh, FP7 project that is ending at the end of this year. So what we did, we took 1,000 genome individuals from five locations, four of them in Europe, from Finland, UK, the CEU sample, which is Northern European from Utah, some kind of complicated ancestry, but they're assigned to be Northern European, and Tuscans from Italy, and also we took a sample from, from Ibadan, Ibadan, Nigeria, uh, which are called the Yoruba samples. These samples were actually, uh, these are, they're lymphoblastoid cell lines, so these have been transformed B cells. And what we did is we grew these cells and we generated uh, mRNA sequencing profiles and small RNA sequencing profiles for these uh, almost 500 individuals, 465 in particular. Almost all of them are actually coming from phase 1000 genomes and for those that did not, we use imputation to derive the variants. So we have a very, very dense uh, nucleotide variation map. Uh, for both SNPs and indels and a little bit of copy number variation, although the low coverage for copy number variation doesn't give us as much of confidence as uh, one would like relative, for example, to high coverage. And as I said, sequencing was done in seven European labs, and we had a very interesting uh, replication set where five samples were sequenced in all the labs, and about 300 samples that were sequenced in the six labs were we're sequencing also in our lab in Geneva to assess how replicable the, the transcriptome profiles are across labs. Now the first thing one can do is to just look at transcriptome QTLs. And transcriptome is not just expression level, but you can see it in many different ways. You can have a phenotype at the exon level and correcting for the number of exons per gene, you can ask for how many genes you have an exon EQTL and you find that there's close to 8,000 genes that have an exon QTL that integrate some of the exon inclusion uh, variants, which of course have to do with splicing. You can look at whole gene expression, if we have about half of them, so that shows you that just looking at whole gene expression doesn't give you the resolution that you would like relative to exon QTLs. You can look at transcript ratios, which for the moment that's a, that's a very uh, noisy process of deriving transcript quantities from our mRNA seq data. We have uh, microRNA QTLs, about 10% of the, of, the, of the cases. We have repeat QTLs that are nearby uh, the, the expressed genes. And, and, and also, surprisingly, we have RNA editing QTLs. And these are not RNA edited sites that are just DNA RNA differences, but these are bona fide RNA DNA differences that have been known to, to operate in the, in the sort of the, the, the standard mechanism for RNA editing. And about 8, eight to 10 percent of them are actually genetically determined. So the degree of editing depends on genetic variation nearby. The next thing we can do is because we have sequencing data and because we're looking at common variants is to actually ask what is the enrichment of the lead variant of an EQTL uh, in those different annotations coming mostly from ENCODE and the, and the epigenome roadmap, NIH roadmap. And as you can see, and just looking at the red bar in particular, you can see that pretty much all the, the, the annotations are enriched with a few exceptions. And you can actually derive, uh, 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 we have, we developed a methodology by looking at the decay of the signal as you look to the lead variant. So if you take, for example, this case, you see the 15, that's a 10 to the minus 15, that's significant. And you see that there's a red bar, a yellow bar, a green bar, and a blue bar. Now, that, that, that 
yellow bar is actually the, the enrichment of the second best variant for each EQTL. The blue bar is, the, sorry, the green bar is the fifth ranked uh, variant for each EQTL, and the uh, blue one is the tenth. And from that decay, because you expect that as you go away from the lead variant, your enrichment is, is, is likely to drop, and the more likely the first one is a causal variant, the more that drop occurs in the rest of the variants. Ideally, if you had the causal variant in all cases, that drop would be so abrupt that no, no, none of the lower ranked variants would have an enrichment. By modeling that decay, we can actually estimate that about 55% of the variants, the lead variants, are actually causal for the, for the AQTL, for the expression effect. And if you look at the African population, we estimate that it's about 74%, because in that case, we have a uh, linkage equilibrium that decays faster, so therefore, resolution is higher. We can also use a little specific expression, and that's, I don't know if that's Windows to Mac or Arabic to English or something, but that's certainly not what I wrote. Um, and basically, these are two different alleles, and you can take the reads from the two different alleles uh, and uh, basically count the relative abundance of green to red. And you can also do that in terms of structure. So you can say, given that this read maps to that particular position, where is the second read? And you can see that the variability is, is, very, is, very, is very different. And you can actually have a two by two table of looking at significance of this. And I'm sorry you cannot even read this, but uh, it's supposed to have something meaningful in there. So basically, the idea is that what you can actually derive uh, relative quantities of variance and, and using a binomial test and corrections for mapping and so on, a very rigorous process and blacklisting of variance for other types of properties, you can derive a set of positions that are differentially expressed. The two alleles are differentially expressed. And Tuli Lapalainen, who was the lead author in, uh, in this project, developed a method that you can co discover EQTLs using LL specific effects. And we, long story short, we discovered a very large number of those that have a 55% overlap with the EQTLs we discovered with a simple genotypic test. So these are two orthogonal methodologies. One is looking at the cross population behavior, the other one is looking at the individual level behavior consistent across individuals and uh, among the alleles. And uh, because these are two orthogonal things, you expect that if the truth is there, they would discover similar things, and they do. And then what we wanted to see is that if you take now the variants that are discovered by both, do you actually improve the enrichment in functional variants, in, in causal variants, and actually you do. So the red bar is the one when you do the genotypic EQTL analysis. If you now condition on those being discovered with an allylic effect, which is again an orthogonal property, you see that the enrichment now becomes even stronger, and we move anywhere from 55%, which was the original estimate, to something like 70 to 75% of estimating that these are causal variants. And that essentially tells you that as you integrate even the same omics technology in a different analytical uh, structure, you can actually get closer to the causal variant, even though you haven't done a specific experiment for that particular cause of variance. So this is statistical inference, and of course for any individual variant that is followed up, you need to have a validation. And we can show that in many cases these are actually creating a differential binding, like for example for CTCF you can see that in the null you get a much lower deviation from the 50-50 allylic binding than you get for example for these causal, as expected to be causal variants. Finally we have effects at the transcript level, so these are what we call loss of function, so you can find, for example, a splice motif that is, that is uh, disrupted, so you reduce the inclusion of the, the next exon, or you can have a stop codon that is gained, and by that you, you activate nonsense mediated decay, and you see that this effect is actually pretty pronounced. So to summarize, I'm not going to go into detail on that part, but essentially the integration of genome and transcriptome alone could give you a lot more information about the functionality of the genome itself. And, and what I, I, I'm, I'm willing to argue is that this debate of whole, whole genome versus uh, uh, exome sequencing is actually done outside of the context of adding transcriptome. And, and, my, and my personal opinion is that if one has actually transcriptome from a tissue that might be relevant, it's actually much more beneficial to do whole genome sequencing, even with a current difference in price, because you can get much more information with respect to functionality of non-coding DNA than you get just by looking at DNA sequence. So I'm going to actually go into now a more sort of translational, in a way, um, direction, which is to try to integrate some of that knowledge into a, a, a real medical problem, which is colorectal cancer. You've heard a lot about it yesterday. So what we did in collaboration with uh, people from Denmark and in, in the context of this CISCOL project, which is 
Uh, another European project led by UC Taipal and, and Karolinska is we have 103 pairs of matched tumor normal uh, samples. So these are basically normal from the vicinity of the sample of, that was taken from the tumor. And uh, this is one of the, the cases in cancer where you actually know what the normal tissue is like. Because, for example, in breast cancer, you don't know what the normal tissue that you sample is and where the cells that are, are uh, uh, creating the tumor are coming from. And what we did is we generated um, uh, RNA sequencing as well as we took 20 reference tissues to use as sort of a, a, a reference for our transcriptome and of the cell type. Um, we generally get a very similar uh, effect in terms of enrichment of over underexpressed, and I'm not going to go into detail about it because this is more sort of uh, type of um, uh, results that have been shown before. With three species, there's a signal in cell cycle regulation of wind signaling as uh, highly pronounced in those differentially expressed genes. We get a typical, a typical examples where you have, for example, an exon that is completely missed in the tumor transcriptome, but it's highly used in the normal transcriptome. And when you look at tumor transcriptions, why the tumor transcripts are highly variable, they tend to cluster together as if they have some very similar properties relative to the normal transcriptomes, even though, as we said, they're genetically matched, which means that the genotypes are shared across these two squares as opposed to uh, within. Now, we're going to again look at a little specific expression. I told you how we use this. There's a lot of sites that obviously have a little specific differences that are significant, both in the normal and the tumor samples. And that's not a surprise. But we see many more actually for the tumor because you have an, an, an added effect for loss of heterozygosity, which is uh, something that uh, actually generates a differential uh, level of allelic expression. So here we have uh, two different categories. You have shared effects, which are uh, in black. You have normal uh, only uh, allele specific expression. You have tumor only allele specific expression. And shared effects that are reversed, which are actually very interesting because what you do is you, you create another effect and an already existing effect in normal. And as you see, it's much more uh, likely to get an allele specific site in the tumor than in the normal. Now, one of the things that is, that is interesting about this allele specific expression is that it is not a property of the population, but it's a property of an individual. So that means that if you have a somatic non-coding variant that landed on the haplotype and actually created a differential level of expression from the original one, that would actually lead to a little specific expression that is only present in tumor. So what we can do is we can actually summarize these types of effects. And we can look for uh, these uh, allele specific effects that is, are only present in the tumor, which, I, which they summarize somatic regulatory variants, loss of heterozygosity of, or copy number amplification in an allele specific way, which on itself is, is quite interesting. Now the first thing we can do, of course, is try to, uh, to use RNA sequencing to discover somatic mutations alone. So these are protein coding somatic mutations for the moment. And because you, the same way you can do exome sequencing, you can do RNA sequencing. And because you're sequencing the coding part, you can discover somatic mutations. And these are the genes that have a significantly increased somatic mutation rate relative to the null. And some of the old known, um, uh, known genes are actually part of there. So actually, that works. And one can actually say that probably, because RNA sequencing tells you what's expressed, maybe that's the thing that you mostly care about. So if exome sequencing becomes quite expensive, maybe RNA sequencing is, a, is an interesting um, a proxy, assuming you have enough material and uh, you don't have any problems with RNA degradation. Now, you can also go into this tumor-specific specific expression that I was saying before. So you can imagine you have a normal column where there's an, uh, the, this is a homozygous site. You get a somatic mutation here. And because you have differential, uh, you have heterozygous in the transcript, now, because of that somatic mutation and differential binding, you end up having differential expression of this. So essentially, you, you try to find this mutation, but you cannot, because there's so many of them that you cannot tell the difference between functional and non-functional. But whatever is functional is going to drive differential expression of T to G. So we can use RNA sequencing, that differential expression, as a proxy to regulatory effects. And sure enough, when you correlate the degree of these ASC events, which are now treated as somatic events, these are somatic ASC events, to somatic mutation rate in non-coding, in encoding sequences, so this comes from COSMIC, which is a database uh, at the Sanger Institute, you get a, a very significant and positive correlation. So that means that genes that are already implicated from non-synonymous uh, coding somatic mutations also have an increased level of regulatory effects that are somatic as well. 
Now you can do a specific test and do all pairs of genes and, and try to find genes that have an excess of that. And by doing that, you actually get a significant excess of, of uh, these um, increased um, uh, effects of somatic uh, regulatory effects. In, in some of the genes, you see here a, a sort of bimodal distribution. So most of the genes don't have anything. And these are only the genes that have no zero uh, count. Uh, and, and many of these genes actually have a, a very large proportion. So there are some genes that are very different from the majority of the other genes. Now what you can do is you can then take these values, and, and I, what, I want, what I wanted to say first is that this value here, this pi 1, is essentially the number of significant pairwise gene tests. So if you take, for example, one individual gene, you test it with all the other genes, you take all the p-values, and you ask how many of them are statistically significant, actually how much enrichment you have in the p-value distribution, and you end up with a score, which in some cases is quite extreme. So that means that if you're 100%, that means that that gene is different from all the other genes in a significant way. Now, if you take that score now, that is, that is on this axis, and distribute it with, in three different categories, other genes, genes involved, that are in the pan-cancer, as we say, and genes that are specifically implicated in colorectal cancer, you see that there's an increase in that, in that score. So again, showing that genes that have already been implicated in colorectal cancer or cancer in general, have an excess of regulatory effects relative to genes that are just generally uh, not implicated yet or not implicated at all. So we can derive a specific score now in the same way you would do it for coding mutations for what we call allelic dysregulation. So we can look for GADs, genes with allelic dysregulation. And here's a number of genes, there's 71 of them, that actually have an excess of these individual somatic allele-specific effects at an FDR of 5%. And now we can discuss about these types of genes. Uh, they actually clearly stand out in that initial score, but they're not representing the full scale. So there's a lot of genes that are different, and probably there's statistical biases for so many genes to be different, but the ones that we, we actually uh, fished out from the population of genes turn out to be the ones that have the most extreme scores. So generally, they, they fit in that initial context that we were looking for. And they actually have a lot of uh, these genes appear to have a lot of effects by individuals. So you have some individuals that have to 23 uh, individual dysregulation effects um, relative, for example, to some that have only one or two. Now you can go even further and look for something that is even, even uh, less addressed by the community, which is to find germline variants that were silent in, in, to, in normal but have become active in the tumor. So essentially what you're looking for is regulatory effects, or, or EQTLs, that are only present in the tumor sample but not in the normal. And so here's an example. You have a, a GA variant here that is not in a regulatory region because that region is not active. You transition to a tumor state now that becomes a regulatory region because of some epigenetic change in chromatin modifications. And now these allelic effect here could actually be detected relative to something that you wouldn't detect before. Now, if you imagine now you have a combination of this effect with a somatic mutation in the coding sequence, you can start talking about epistatic effects between the two. Now, we can actually use that, and we discover, sure enough, tumor-specific EQTLs, normal specific, normal EQ, sorry, tumor EQTLs, normal EQTLs, and about 60% of them overlap, which is not surprising. They follow the same patterns that they cluster close to the transcription start sign and so on. And they, as I say, they overlap by about 62%. Now, what we can do then is we can ask in the same way we did before for enrichments of the different types of variants. And we can only take the 376 EQTLs that are specific to tumors. So these are only in tumors, very significant, completely flat in, in normal. So there's absolutely no signal in the normal tissue. And look for the enrichment of that lead EQTL as we did before. And here's the ranking that you see. So this is ranked by the tumor-specific enrichment. You see the red. And this shows the enrichment in, the, sh in the, the shared one. So the EQTLs that are present in both tumor and normal. And what is interesting is that the ranking that you dis discover in the, in the tumor is not predictive of the ranking of the share. So we're actually accessing a different level, a different type of biology by looking at that, these tumor-specific EQTLs. Now what is even more interesting is if you just take if you just look for those that are highly differentially enriched, so let's say, for example, IRX3, which is very highly enriched for the tumor in red, 
low enrichment for the, for the, for the normal in blue, you can find those, the, the top ones that you have in this ranking, and ask what are these transcription factors. And these are the transcription factors that you have. IRX3, E2F4, NFL1, uh, 3, TFP2, COX1, and LEF1. And the interesting thing is that all these transcription factors are very significantly overexpressed in the tumor. So the differential enrichment that you generate in terms of the EQTL presence, the EQTL location, is driven by the change in the level of expression, the increase in the level of expression of these transcription factors. So essentially, you transition to a tumor state, you increase the expression of Rx3, and you activate locations in the genome that were previously non-active. And that's why you generate these tumor-specific EQTLs, which could actually be drivers. And we know that they're likely to be drivers because now these genes that have these EQTLs are highly enriched for genes that already have encoding somatic mutation rates and are highly enriched for pan-cancer genes. So what we have is two categories. We have somatic mutations that drive regulatory effects. We can generally detect in the, in the sort of the general aspect of looking at a little specific expression in the, in the individual level. But we also have germline variants, which are inactive in the, tum in the normal, but become active and likely driving the tumor in the, in the tumor state. So this is basically addressing not only the known coding part that has been inaccessible in, in cancer studies, but is also opening a new category of variants, because so far the community has been talking mostly about two types of variants, predisposition and somatic variants. Now we can have a third category, which are germline variants that are actually somatically active. And that is not a, actually a very surprising category at the end, but it's, a, it's an interesting one to be considering both of the regulatory and the coding variant. So with that, I want to acknowledge the big consortium, the Giovannis Consortium, that actually worked uh, very hard in a very nice collaborative way to generate the studies that I've mentioned before, and um, the, the collaborators in the Cisco project, and of course, uh, my laboratory and the funding agency. Thank you very much. for a very nice and comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, I would suggest that we uh, leave the question